Jared, I think we're probably good to get rolling here. Right. Party time. Awesome. Okay. Well, well thanks everyone for joining. Um, we are really excited to bring advanced dashboarding uh, technique to you today um, on this on this lovely Wednesday here. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, as you all know, uh, once a month, in the middle of the month, we we have this meetup uh, where we talk about various Tableau topics and discussion points. Um, continue to tell your network that. You know about this meetup. We want we want this to grow. We want to you know keep offering sessions in the next year. Uh, so, but you know, in general, thank you for for the attendance and and participating uh, in these sessions with us. Um, just a quick uh, you know overview of our agenda today. You're going to hear from Jared again. He's our lead consultant uh, at Zeomatrix. He's going to be talking about uh, advanced dashboarding. He's got some really good examples that he's going to cover that can take your dashboards to the next level. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be talking uh, all things dashboarding today, right? Just a, always a reminder that we are uh, in a Zoom meeting, a virtual meeting format. We have done things a little bit differently the, the last session and this session in that if you would like to come off of mute and ask a question, particularly as Jared's going through these examples, you're more than welcome to do that. Otherwise you could use the chat window as well. Um, and just if you could stay muted uh, if, if uh, you don't have any questions, but we want to make this more engaging, more interactive uh, as we do more of these sessions. So uh, yeah, feel free to come off of mute. Uh, and we can certainly do that at the Q&A uh, in the end. All right. So this is our last uh, event for the year, which is kind of crazy. We're, we're almost in, uh, in 2024. Um, our next session guys will be TBD. We're going to come up with a new list of data-driven events for next year. Um, so more information to come out there. We're targeting January 17th, which is a Wednesday, I believe, uh, for that next event. So you'll have more information coming out, but we're going to see you in 2024. This will be the last session that we have for the year, which is crazy that we're at that point. Um, but thank you again for, for going along on this journey with us as we bring new data topics to you every month. We really look forward to seeing you next year and tell tell your colleagues and friends and we'd love to grow this even more. Um, we're gonna hear from Jared today. Again, Jared's our lead consultant at Zero Matrix. He's got over eight years of experience in the product. Um, we have a bullet point that he loves calculations. He loves dashboarding, he loves parameters. He likes the product as a whole, I would say. He's very passionate about Tableau. Um, I've been uh, with Zero Matrix five years and, and used to work at Tableau and, um, have around nine years actually of experience in the product. So I'll be helping out, kind of be your MC today as usual. Um, and we'll have a really good demo to show you here today. Um, today's topic is on advanced dashboarding. All right, so here's what you're gonna be able to take away. And again, these sessions are recorded. You're gonna look, we're gonna look at, um, let me go to the next slide here, one second. Okay, we're gonna look at these topic areas today. Uh, Jared's going to talk about containers, how to use them appropriately, um, why they're important, uh, how, they, how, how they can really level up your design uh, of your Tableau dashboards. He'll touch on uh, the importance of filter actions. He'll touch on dynamic zone visibility, which I believe we touched on, Jared, in the last session as well. So that's kind of a, we're coming back to that because this is a great feature to be thinking about in the product. Um, we'll talk about show hide buttons, what, where that can be useful. Uh, we'll talk about info buttons, talk about padding, what that can do for your dashboards to polish them up. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with navigation buttons. So th these are all topic areas that will help you take your dashboard to the next level, right? If you have questions throughout, don't hesitate to come off mute. We, we can take questions on the fly or feel free to use the chat window. I can address those as they come in. And if you wanna to wait to the Q&A at the end, you're more than welcome to do that too. So we're trying to make this more interactive. So um, yeah, let's, let's get rolling. Jared, I'm gonna pass it to you for the live demo. I'm gonna stop sharing here. Uh, give me one sec. Okay. Sweet. So Stuart, you know, we, we talked about this, this idea of kind of leveling up dashboard design and, and what does that look like? What does it take to do that? So where I wanted to start today 
is a really simple dashboard. We've got some filters, some KPIs, a couple of vises. This is, this is really similar to what we see when we get brought into engagements with clients a lot of times. It's a clean dashboard. It's you know very clear what's going on with it. Um, there are just a, a few small things that we could do to kind of improve this and just, just tweak it a little bit. So when you have a dashboard like this to start with, when we talk about containers, the default for a Tableau dashboard when you start dragging out sheets or objects is they're going to fall into a tiled container. And the tiled container lets you put something pretty much anywhere you want which is nice. Uh, you know, it's really easy to just click and drag objects or sheets around your dashboard, but it has some limitations as well. So if we start looking at this dashboard, we can pick out a few things that aren't like the best visual design. So like with these filter boxes, they're kind of separated. They're in, you know, they've got this padding in between them and we could kind of remove that, be a little bit tedious. Um, that's something we might want to address. We move down to our KPI boxes. They're not quite even. So we can like adjust these a little bit and try and get them a little bit closer to even. Maybe eyeball that. We can actually use the layout pane as well to get an idea of this. So if I click on this sheet, it's going to tell me this is 310 pixels wide. And this one's 348. And this one's 326. So visually, they look pretty close, but they're actually not that even. And if we want to get these closer to the same size, we've got to kind of click and drag and double check. And it's it's just a very tedious process to try and get these more even when they're just in the tiled uh, tiled container on the dashboard. Same thing is true for like these uh, these two sheets here. They look roughly the same size. This one's 294 pixels. This one's 298. I mean, that's close enough for, for a lot of work, but uh, I think we can get that a little bit closer as well. So if we look at this on the, on the item hierarchy, we can see that tiled container. I might've snuck a horizontal in here. That was, uh, that was my mistake. That shouldn't be on the tiled demo. But uh, so we have, you know, everything inside this tiled container. If we move over to the version of this dashboard that uses containers, it starts to look just a little bit cleaner. You know, we don't have as much separation between everything. Things start to look a little bit more cohesive. And I want to go through how this is built. And then like step by step, this is how we would do something like this. And here's why we would do this. So just by clicking around on this dashboard, we can start to see, if I double click here, these objects are now all in a horizontal container. So on the tiled demo, we've got this like padding in between the objects, those like gray lines, it looks very brick-like. On this demo, we have a background color on the container that all of those are in. So it just makes them all white all the way across. And it makes it look like those go together. That's like one object. This is our filters bar, as opposed to these are the three filters that we have at the top of our sheet. And then similarly for the KPI boxes, these are all inside of a horizontal container. And because they're in a horizontal container, back over here, we have to like click and drag to try and get these to be the same size. And what we don't have here on the tiled container that we do in the horizontal is in the horizontal, we can edit it and fix the width of the object. So we can say, I want this to be exactly 300 pixels. And the KPI box next to it, I want that one to be exactly 300 pixels and so on. So now these are all exactly 300 pixels wide. And we don't have to click and drag to try and get them to be close enough that you can't really tell that they're not the same when you look at it. We can just make them the same by just like dropping down this menu and going to edit width. And we can set that to whatever width we want. And I added in a couple of blanks on either side just to kind of make that KPI bar look a little bit 
um, separate from the rest of the sheet just to draw the eye a little bit to it. And those are also in that same horizontal container. And then down below, these two objects uh, are within a vertical container. And what we've done here is we've used this distribute contents evenly object, or not object, but option. And what this does is it takes everything in this container, which is these two sheets, and it just automatically makes them the same size. So if we were to make this container larger, it's going to keep that same size. And now we've got 304 high, 303 high. That's as close as you can get with an odd number. And that's where we end up. So that distribute contents evenly is another way that we can just really quickly make similar things a similar size. So that instead of having to click and drag and try and you know, like mess around with the heights, we can just set it to distribute them evenly from jump. So that's within a vertical container. That vertical container exists within a larger vertical container. So if we wanted to build this from scratch, this is how I typically start all of my dashboard builds. I'm gonna come over on the dashboard side and I'm just gonna drop a vertical container into that tiled and I'm gonna build everything that I build from the top down. So I would take a text object and I'd drop a title in. And if you have a logo that you wanna use either for an internal or external facing dashboard, you can drop in a horizontal container at the top and put your logo and then the title in there. The one thing that I'll mention on containers is if you ever put an empty container into an empty container, it becomes pretty much impossible to like get an object to drop into the first one. So if you ever have something like that, I'd recommend dropping in a blank and you can just kind of use that blank to block and space things within the container. So here I've got now my title and the blank and I could bring in a horizontal container and drop it right underneath that title. And with that horizontal container, I'm gonna bring over my filters. And the thing with containers too is like, you can tell by what is shaded dark gray where that object is gonna land. The same way that you can in the tiled, you can in like a horizontal or vertical. So here in this horizontal, I'm looking for it to be dark gray on the right side of that. I could throw it on the left too, but I'm going left to right. So I'm going to hit this on the right side. This is going to put it like just over the top of the container that I'm in, which I don't want. This is going to put it inside that container. We get the blue outline, which tells us that it's going to go in the container. And the dark gray shading tells us what side of the container it's going on. This, and this is, by the way, the most frustrating element of containers, guys. Oh yeah. Is is getting it in the container. So that that is a really good point to harp on, Jared. Is like it could be out of the container or you gotta make sure it's in <laughs> there to get the features that you or the outcome you want. So good to yeah, call that out. And it's really tough too if you have a really skinny container. Like if I make this really narrow, it I guess it's making it easier for me this time, but there are times when it'll be really tough to get it to actually land in the container when it's that narrow. So you can always just like make this bigger, drop in your other object. I'm gonna bring this blank in as well because I like using blanks for spacing. And then we can make that you know more narrow again. So I've got all of those filters in there now. And like we did on the demo as it stood when we started, we can come over into layout and change the background color for that horizontal container to white. And it's just gonna fill in all that empty space. Um, just for the sake of time, I'll also point out, you can move entire containers with objects in them. So I'm just gonna grab this whole horizontal that has our KPIs in it and bring that over into, oh, are we doing this outside of our vertical? This is always great when something goes wrong on a demo. So this is like two verticals. That's so weird. Okay. So for some reason, our container duplicated. Oh, and this is a separate one now. Oh, that's very strange. Okay. There we go. That was weird. I'm so glad we're recording this so that we can't edit that out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 
So we'll bring this over as well. Um, and it's doing the same thing. All right. And then we'll bring our two sheets in, although those did exist in their own vertical container. So now if we come back over here, this one's 297, this one's 295. If we bring out a vertical container and drop those two sheets in there, we can set those to distribute contents evenly again like they were. And that will just barely change that by a pixel. And Jared, it it's probably worth calling out, like you can distribute contents evenly in two ways. You can double click that tab that Jared was doing, right? And so that highlights the sheets in the container. It might be more than two, it could be 10, right? Or you can select the drop down menu from one of those sheets, I believe, Jared, and do select, in this case, it's a vertical container. But once you do that, it grabs the sheets in the container, then you can fit them evenly. Um, so a couple ways to get there. I just wanted to call that out. Yeah, so if we clicked on this KPI, we click this drop down and select the horizontal container. And from the horizontal container, we can also select the vertical container. So you can go all the way up to the tiled container that contains everything as well. So yeah, these- I, I did not know that. That's, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially once you get into like, you know, if you're running KPIs that are actually three sheets stacked on top of each other, so you have three verticals that are inside of a horizontal <laughs> that's inside of a vertical, you can get a maze of containers and it can be helpful to just be able to trace that up the train, um, particularly if you're trying to get like pixel perfect formatting. There are like two ways to get pixel perfect formatting. Either you use containers and you edit the widths and heights and you distribute contents evenly, or you float every single object on your dashboard and you can never change anything without like editing the whole thing, which is a nightmare. So that would be the alternative is to use like all floating objects. And if you float, you can actually set the X, Y position and the width and height of everything so that you can place it exactly just like you're mapping it out on a piece of poster board. But then if you ever wanna add in another sheet, you have to edit the width and height and the X, Y of every other sheet on the dashboard to make room for it. So we recommend containers for what's hopefully obvious reasons at this point over uh, floating. Is that, uh, Stuart, am I missing anything on containers? I'm trying to think. No, I think, I think just generally for anyone on the call that's not used containers, it is, like Jared mentioned, an effective way to get a good fit between your sheets, like an actual great fit. Um, there's there's just formatting benefits that come with it. It's It looks cleaner. Uh, so it, it really is um, a, a great option um, for, for solid dashboards, either horizontal or, or, uh, or vertical containers. So that, that's like the biggest takeaway, right? Is that it'll really level up your dashboard. And I guess the other thing is containers also enables some of the other functionality that we're going to get into later. So dynamic zone visibility and show hide buttons, you can leverage containers for those to, to really make those features more useful as well. And I'll, I'll circle back to that when we get to those items. Yeah. So if we, if we take our, our new dashboard now, it's just a little bit more clean, a little bit more polished. Everything's looking a little bit more put together. Let's talk filter actions and dynamic zone visibility. So we talked about dynamic zone visibility in the last session that we did on parameters. And dynamic zone visibility leverages a Boolean true-false field to either show or hide content based on when that is true or false. And the easiest way to do that is just with a parameter or um, using a parameter to control a value that's gonna be true or false. And I have a parameter up here to show subcategories that's defaulted to no, but if we flip it to yes, it's gonna create this subcategory breakdown uh, pop up just right over the top of my category performance. Uh, dashboard best practices, is it best to go from subcategory to, to category from top down? No, but this was a quick demo that we threw together. 
Um, this is driven just by this parameter and it's a Boolean parameter, true, false. So to recap from what we talked through last time, when we highlight this subcategory breakdown sheet on the layout tab, we get this control visibility using value option. And because the show subcategories field is a Boolean parameter, it's gonna have a value of true or false. We can use that true or false to control when this sheet is shown. So we can set that to no, and we just see our sales year over year. When we set it to yes, this subcategory breakdown is just floating on top. So when it's on no, it's invisible. When it's on yes, it's visible. And it's just, yeah, just straight there over the top, hidden when we don't want to see it. And instead of using like a true false parameter, we could use like a parameter action, which I think is what we covered in the last call to say, if we click on technology, then we want that parameter to equal technology. And if the parameter equals anything other than none, it's going to be true. And that's what we'll use to control the visibility on this object. So that's something that uh, I think that recording is up on YouTube. If you want to get more into like parameter actions and how to use those to control dynamic zone visibility, uh, I'd highly recommend that because it's a really cool functionality. And um, circling back to what we were just talking about, we can use this dynamic zone visibility to control the visibility of the sheet, but we can also use it for entire objects, like entire containers. So this wouldn't be a good use case for this, but we can do the same thing use this show subcategories to show and hide the whole horizontal container that controls our KPIs. And it just disappears when it's on no. So if we didn't have those in a container, we would have to set that like individually for all of the five different objects, the three KPIs and two blanks in that container. It'd be way more tedious, but because we're using a horizontal container, we can control the visibility at the container level which makes sheet swapping, drill downs, all way easier than they were in Tableau like a year ago. Jared, there was a, a good question that came in from Kim. Uh, she, she was asking, is, is the subcategory viz its own sheet that's being laid on top or is it just adding a dimension to the existing viz? That's a great question. Yeah, so to cover that, the subcategory breakdown is its own sheet. And so this sheet exists like on its own and the sheet is technically on this dashboard even when it's not shown. So dynamic zone visibility is just like making it invisible. We can see what's behind it, but that sheet is technically still on the dashboard even when it's not visible. Does that help? Yeah, in many ways, like it seems like this new functionality dynamic zone visibility is like you maybe in the past you you would have too many views and it would get cluttered and you might think about having another dashboard right but now zone visibility can just make things invisible and hide them until you need them so you can almost have one dashboard that that encompasses that is that a fair like is that fair to say jared i guess yeah yeah it's it's like having pockets if you ever had like a jacket without pockets and then you get pockets, now you can put more stuff in your pockets. It's great. Like that. that was <laughs> so, on the fly. You haven't thought about that. That was good. Yeah. It's so this, good. yeah, this just gives us like a little pocket that we can keep this extra viz in. And then we you can tell our end users, hey, if you want to see subcategory breakdown, I got that in my back pocket. Yeah. And we can just show it right there. So it lets you, it lets you pack a little bit more visual um, punch in the same space, the same way that like a Viz in tooltips does. This just gives you another option to show more data in the same space. Um, so, so moving on just a little bit to filter actions. This is another really nice interactivity add for your dashboards. There's a couple different ways to set up filter actions to where we wanna let our end users click on something and change the data that's on the dashboard. The easiest way to do it is to click on this use as filter button. And if we, 
excuse me, if we click on that, it's going to create a filter action automatically to where now if we click on technology, we're going to see our KPIs and our line graph change to just reflect technology data. We can do the same for office supplies and furniture and all that data is going to change, which is really slick. I mean, it lets your end users drill down just a little bit and see that next level analysis. If we wanted to do the same thing for like the sales year over year so that we could drill into just like one month or one quarter of data, and we don't want to use this, we can also set it up manually. So if we come up to the dashboard menu and come into actions, we're going to see the automated ones that were like already created and we clicked on other sheets and we can add an action. So we'll add a filter action. There's also a bunch of other actions that there's probably a ton of great tech notes on online on Tableau forums about, uh, but we don't have time to get into today. So we're going to create a filter action and this is just going to be our sales year over year action. And the source sheet is going to be the sheet that starts the action. What do we want to click on to affect the rest of the sheets? And that's going to be our sales year over year, which I believe is Viz 1. So this is what we want to interact with. And the target sheets are what do we want to affect with that interaction. So we want to pick basically everything except the source sheet in this case. Um, we're going to leave the filter on all fields. This is all the same data source. The fields are all the same. So we don't need to get into this too much. The only other thing we're going to change is we're going to select run action on select instead of menu. If you do hover, anytime you hover over data, it's going to run that action, which can be pretty taxing on the processing power of Tableau cloud or your machine, and maybe a little bit like confusing for your end users. Menu will let you click, and in the tooltip, there will be a little link to run that action. And select just is a middle option where when you click on something or highlight it, it's going to run that action. Uh, and then what do you want it to do when you unclick that? Do you want it to keep the filter, blank out everything, or show everything? And we'll just pick show all values. So by default, when you click the use as filter, it defaults to run on select and show all values and filter all fields. And you can always check that too if you come back over here to whichever filter you're generating. And we can uh, you know, we can see what that looks like. So the other one is running from Viz2 on all the sheets. It's going to show all values and run action on select. So now that we have that set up for the sales year over year, now, if we just want to look at December, we can highlight December this year and last year, and it's going to change all that data. If we want to look at just Q4, we can select October through December, and it's going to change all of that. If we just want to see like the last uh, month, we can just single select click, and obviously that's only this year, but we're going to see just this year's numbers. And the same will also affect the subcategory breakdown that we had because it's its own sheet on the dashboard. So those filter actions can give um, just a really a really nice extra tool for your end users to do some of that drill down within the dashboard, get some more information. Uh, you know, we can start looking at, okay, office supplies and just the last quarter, boom. And they can do that all from the same dashboard. So yeah, there's uh, there's some fun stuff that you can do with these. Stuart, Jared, right? go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The other, yeah, the other thing I might say is like, it, it, this seems very uh, sort of basic, but but important to it. And users like a lot of times we will label in the header of the sheet like click to filter just to mm. give them some sort of indication that like hey there are actually action on this report. So uh, it's it's something you want to consider because they might not know that um right that it, that it can filter so just thought i'd mention that yeah so we can do it as simple as that just like smaller text next to the title click a category to filter views above yeah. and then boom now they know so some of it may just be end user training and getting them used to looking for something like that but you can also um include you know some of that uh info text say you know highlight Months 
to filter other views. Boom. Mm -hmm. And now they just know, oh, okay, so if I come in and I highlight a few months, it's going to filter everything else. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good call out, Stuart. I like that mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. All right. We're tracking pretty good on time. I figured we'd spend a lot of the first time on, on containers and <laughs> filters and dynamic zone visibility. Um, so let's let's talk buttons. Buttons is the other place that the containers are going to play a big role. So on this sheet, it's a little bit different from the one that we had in that we no longer have our filters bar up at the top. And that's because we've hidden it behind this filter button. And this button just lets us show and hide that real quick and easy. There's a, there's a few reasons that you might want to do this. It's nice for real estate, especially if you have, you know, eight, 10 filters on your filter bar. I have clients with filter bars that are two rows. We have one client who's running uh, a propensity scoring model dynamically in Tableau desktop. And we have a control panel button that lets them flip down 35 different parameters that they can use to edit that propensity scoring model. And you know you don't wanna see that on the dashboard all the time because 35 parameters, a five by seven grid takes up most of the dashboard. So instead we have it hidden behind a button where when they click that button, it's just a floating container that will pop in. And the setup for this is really easy. If you have an object or a container and you go into this dropdown, there's a little option for add a show hide button. And it's going to come up like this. It's like a little X. You can click and drag it wherever you want. And then if you edit that button, it's going to let you choose what you want it to look like when it's shown and hidden. Uh, you can choose either a text or an image button. So in this case, I just chose uh, just a filter icon that I got from PowerPoint's uh, icon library and went ahead and made that the image for when it's shown and hidden. You can also do text. So when the item is shown, we can say KPIs. And when it's hidden, we might want to say show KPIs. And then if we do that, let me make that a little bit bigger. Now we've got a little button that we can say, all right, I want to click on that and hide the KPIs. And now I want to show them. So it's, it's super straightforward, but it, again, just gives you options to put a few more views on your dashboard or some things that might not be necessary to see all of the time, but people might want to see. This is great for um, you know filter bars, for data dictionaries, glossaries, things like that. It's really useful for, for all of that. Also, if you have folks who want to screenshot dashboards and throw them into PowerPoint or something like that, maybe you don't want to show the whole filters bar. So, you know, you can hide the filters bar and get a cleaner view for screenshotting and presenta uh, presentations, things like that. So that's, that's another really easy one. You can do it on um, on objects. So there's an add show hide button for just this sheet. You could do it for like just this legend or for entire containers like we were talking about before. So, you know, if we wanted to show and hide the filters bar and we didn't have these in a container, then again, we would need to have a separate button for each of the four filters or the three filters in the parameter. And it would just be tedious. So really, really drawing home the importance of those containers. The other thing that we have on this dashboard is that little light bulb icon. And the light bulb icon is something that we do sometimes when dashboards need a little bit of extra context, we'll add an info button. And if you hover over that, it's just gonna give you a little bit of extra information about what's going on with this dashboard. What's the purpose? How do you use it? And the setup for this is really straightforward too. It's not super intuitive, but once you know how it's done, it's like a magician revealing his secrets because it's so easy. So all this is, is a separate sheet with a shape mark and a, just a dummy piece of text on detail with a tooltip that has that text in it. 
and that's all it takes. So you just come into a new sheet, you put like info on detail in quotes, that's all this is. And then you change the mark type to shape. And this shape is here under more shapes in like the bug tracking category. It's a little light bulb. Um, you can also add your own custom shapes within your Tableau library. So I'm sure there's some good knowledge base articles on that. It's something that, you know, we've done a few times before. Um, and if you have like a, like a special icon that you want to use, or you want a little eye in a circle for info, you can use custom shapes for things like that and just get a little button that you can hover over and get a little bit of extra information on your dashboard. Let's see. So Jeremy, I'll, I'll we, have we have questions flooding in. Do we want to take <laughs> a few or wait till Q&A? What do you think? No, we, we can take them. We've, yeah. uh, we've got some time. Okay. All right. Well, Danica had a good question I wanted to revisit uh, first. And that is, she says, when, when selecting just a month or a quarter, how does the viewer know or remember which one they choose? Is it a, would you need a dynamic title? Ooh, so dynamic titles are a bit tricky. We can chat about that though. So remembering which ones you picked, if I like select this quarter, it's going to give me, and this isn't our filter action dashboard anymore. It's going to give me just this little highlight around them. Like those button or those dots are a little bit bold almost. So that's one way to remember it. I do want to see what this will do if we try and add the months into the title. Because I think it'll default to like all months. So if I do month of order date and year of order date, I just want to see what this will look like. So all 2022 and 2023. And then if I select these, oh, because it's not filtering this view. Okay, so that is, yeah, this is where the dynamic titles with the field values just doesn't quite work the way that I'd like it to for things like this. Um, I'm trying to think if we were to, we're getting into like some, some hacks now, but if we <laughs> duplicate this and we... Uh, let's see. So if we do that and we were to bring this out and then make this like, I just want to see if we could like sort of chop off the bottom of it and just leave the title and then put them in this title which should be affected by that filter action. So even if we took this out, these are the sorts of questions that I love getting because it's like, oh yeah, how would we do that? <laughs> so there, now we have a very hacky dynamic title That's that says awesome. we're showing October, November, and December, 22 and 23. And if we unselect that, hopefully it won't break and say all the months. Yeah, it just says all. Okay. So that lets you, uh, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend doing it this way because we're loading an entire separate visualization just to, just to get that title in there. But at minimum, it's a duct tape and bubblegum solution for it. That was a fun one. Awesome. Another question that came in. Uh, let me see. Um, yeah, Bridget had a question that, how did you get the last year, this year legend to be horizontal? The uh, last year, this, yeah. You recall so, where that was? So horizontal meaning like to get it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's not going across probably. And going yeah, down. so there's like a couple of ways to adjust legends. If you just kind of mess with the size of the legend object, you can get it to reorient itself, but you can also edit that in the arrange items menu. 
So we can change this from auto arrange to single row and it's going to move that up to this orientation. Yeah. Or, you Bridget, know, was that, was that the answer to your question, Bridget? Is that what you're looking for? Arrange um, items. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, let's, let's continue on Jared. And then there's a couple other good questions we'll come back to uh, in the Q and a, um, but we'll let you wrap on the, on the demo side. Awesome. All right, yep. cool. I'm going to ignore the fact that I just wiped hot sauce in my eye from my tacos. Yeah. <laughs> we'll cut it out in post. It's okay. <laughs> so we talked buttons. Uh, the, the next thing I want to talk about is padding and backgrounds. So we talked a little bit about um, in that switch from tiled to containers, just adding these like blank objects in the KPIs bar just to give it a little bit of spacing and uh, you know separate it visually a little bit from the rest of the dashboard. Using blank objects is one way to do that, but we can also change the padding on objects. And that's in the layout menu here, this outer padding and inner padding. So outer padding is going to adjust the amount of space that's like around the outside of the object itself on the dashboard. And you can set that equally for all sides or uncheck this box or click this little lock icon and you can set it for just one side. Uh, so you can do that for outer padding or inner padding is gonna basically be the same thing, but for the inside. So we notice here, we don't have the gray around it now, we have the white because this is still the same sheet. We're just adding padding to the inside of the sheet as opposed to the outside of the sheet. And that can be useful in a couple of different places. We talked about being able to like take a container and um, and like set the background as white. And that can be handy. Uh, but if we had something like this category performance year over year view, and we wanted to add, now granted, we could also just add a grand total. But if we wanted to have a separate sheet for the grand total and bring that in over here, we might put that in a horizontal container. Let me switch back to tiled here. And then maybe bring in that grand total. Hide that title, this won't line up perfectly. So we can hide this. And that's fine. Maybe I'll actually show that title again, just so it'll line up a little bit better. And we'll just call this grand total. But we have this like space in between that's not really great. If we wanted this to look like it was all a single visualization, what we can do is we can come into the padding, unlock this and take off the right padding from the left viz and then take off the left padding from the right viz and now there's no space in between them so if you have you know two different sheets or two different tables or two different vizs that you want to kind of pseudo stitch together and make them look like they're one chart you can do that by taking away the padding in between them and so it's two separate sheets but now it kind of looks like one um, you can do the same thing vertically. So these don't really line up great with the, uh, you know, with the titles being different sizes. So I could hide both of these titles and then bring in a text box and call this category performance, which I think is what our views were called. I'll make that size 16. We'll make this white. Now this is a situation where this is in a vertical object that we set to distribute contents evenly. So notice as soon as I bring that title in, now it's the same size as my two vizs. And this is a situation where, okay, we're gonna take this and put a second vertical container inside of this first one so that what's inside of the vertical container is actually one sheet and one vertical container. And now those two objects are distributed evenly. 
that might be making things more complicated than it needs to be. If that's confusing, let me know and we can explain that a little more. But in this bottom now, I've got my two sheets in the horizontal and I've got my title above it. And if I wanna just make that title look like it's a title for both of these sheets, I'll do that same thing again. I'll come in here, my horizontal container doesn't have any padding, but the sheets inside do. So I'm gonna take off the top padding from the sheets underneath. I'm gonna take off the bottom padding from the title above it. And now it's all stitched together. It looks like one view, it's actually three separate objects. So padding can be really useful for getting the formatting just how you want it and being able to arrange things just how you want them on the dashboard. The other thing that I wanna at least mention is custom backgrounds. And Stuart, I don't have a demo for this because it's, but it takes time to set up. But I know on our Tableau public page, we've got a demo dashboard that you built that yeah. has a custom background with like the KPI boxes with the nice rounded corners and the shadows. Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe towards the end, um, we can hop over to that and just, just show that to see like, I think that's up in the map. Like you can use background images or background maps. You can add those to your dashboard. So you can put in like a background image and um, and like display that. So instead of having these square KPI boxes, we could use like a nice rounded shape that Tableau doesn't support natively. Um, really great for like infographics or graphic mm -hmm. design type stuff. You can put in nice fancy swoopy arrows between things and you know <laughs> images that you like if you have right. a corporate mascot or something that you want to put up in the corner of your dashboard yeah. so backgrounds can be, sure that. yeah yeah those can be really flexible um we also used those for when we built like a spider chart and i don't know if we have a i don't think we have a demo of that but we basically built a custom background that was like a 12 sided spider web to, you know, rank yeah. different points on. That was a fun one. So background images can, can be pretty powerful if you can get into the hang of those, if you have some, some way to design those. Uh, and the last thing that I want to talk through is navigation buttons. And this is something that, let me see if I can go into presentation mode. So, if you're in Tableau Cloud or Tableau Server and you have a workbook with multiple dashboards, a lot of times you'll have those little text tabs across the top um, that let users click back and forth between different sheets, different dashboards in that workbook. And those are great. Uh, most people find them just fine. But if you have end users who prefer in dashboard navigation, you can do that with navigation buttons. So if we come to like our sales dashboard, all I've done is created different versions of this for sales, profit, orders, and returns, and added nav buttons down the side, like a little menu. And now you can use um, you can use images for these instead of text. But for now, at least, you know we've got our sales button, profit, orders, and returns. And this is set up in a way to where when I click on one of these, it's going to flip me over to my profit dashboard or my orders dashboard. And this lets me navigate really quickly and easily uh, back and forth from those dashboards. And it lets the user see easily which dashboard they're on right inside the current dashboard. And this was something that um, a couple of our other consultants used on a project and I loved it. I was like, you've got to show me how you did that. That is so slick. It turns out, like so many things in Tableau, it's so easy to set up. So I'll go out of presentation mode. All that this is, the only thing that this is, is the same four buttons. And on each sheet, we're just editing the color of the button for the sheet that we're on. So the buttons are set up all the same way. The only difference is I added a border and a lighter background to the sales button on the sales sheet. And on the profit sheet, that sales button has the darker color and no border, but the profit button is a lighter color with a border on it. So it's it feels like it should be way more complicated to 
like set up this intuitive menu bar where Tableau knows what sheet you're on and is going to color the bar, but it's not. You just like set it up while you're building the sheets. And then, you know, if we go back into presentation mode, you end up with this really easy nav system that lets you switch back and forth between sheets on your dashboard and the end user knows where they're at. So I was like blown away by that. I was like, that is the coolest simple solution I've ever seen to in dashboard navigation. I think that was the last thing that I wanted to co cover. I wanted to end with that. And we can uh, hit some questions. Stuart, if you want to demo that custom background dashboard. Oh, sure. Yeah. Jared, I have got... a question here, like just for, yeah. for clarification. Like I understand, I, I think it, it makes sense, like the navigation. Did you, build, so did you build out a dashboard for sales and then build out a dashboard for profit and then for orders and then returns? Yeah, so this is a really bad example in that this is something that we could easily achieve with parameters instead. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's where my mind was going. It's like you could you could have used, uh, I guess, zone visibility and parameters in that. Totally. Okay, okay. If, okay. If, you, if you imagine if you had something like sales, marketing, HR, finance, right. Right. where it's totally different vizs, you know, we didn't have time to build out and we don't have that data in the Superstore data set. But yeah, if you imagine, I know um, there are clients that'll have like a master workbook for some course, sort of like annual reporting or some sort of board level reporting where they just have high level dashboards for a bunch of different departments or functional areas. You could build something like this out and using the navigation button object, which is down here in the objects menu. So this is just in a vertical container on the side of my sheet. So you just come in here and you set which sheet you want it to navigate to. So we could have this take us back to the containers demo. And we call this containers. And I want to make sure that's set right. So yeah, and then it's spelled wrong. But if I click on that, <laughs> it's going to take us to containers. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it opens up ideas for if you ever had this requirement where you need like a landing page for people to jump to reports. Yeah, I guess you could use it in that way, right, Jared? You could have like a, yeah. a basically a dashboard that's all buttons that then take a user to where they want to go uh, and sort of a landing page uh, setting. Yeah, and if we were using, I think we were on sales. So if we were using that as our landing page, which again, mm -hmm. bad example, you know, we could just put a nav button on wherever we're going and say, right, right. back to home. Right, great for back button. You could do an icon that sends you back. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, yeah, yeah, it gives you some really nice, we'll do that for like detail sheets too, to like drill down to detail, go back to home, things like that. So nav buttons can be a fun one too. Awesome. Yeah, there's a question that came in. I want to I want to address from Kim, and then we can take some more. Um, l let me read this out. So, Kim says I, I have a dashboard that has multiple date filters that each only apply to one sheet on the dashboard. Is there a way to create an overarching filter, maybe using dashboard actions, to create a date filter that can be displayed and used to control all of the date filters on the dash? Uh, all of the date filters are from the same data source, but looking at different date fields. Okay. Yeah, so I like this one. Um, this would be a really good one to, I'm trying to remember if we talked about this in our parameters mm -hmm. community webinar, because that's my first thought here, is if we have something like order date and ship date, and we want to look at, anything that was, you know, ordered or shipped within a certain date, date range, we can't like filter on both at once because what was ordered in that date range isn't necessarily what shipped in that date range. What was shipped wasn't necessarily ordered. But what we could do is create date parameters. And there's a couple of ways, um, there's a couple of ways that we could use date parameters, but the easiest would just be we put in a start date and an end date. And then we expose that as the filter. And we say we want it to be between December 1 and December 13. And when we come in here, 
assuming that we had those parameters, we we'll just call this date filter. And then we would say the order date is greater than or equal to our start date parameter. And the order date is less than or equal to our start date parameter. I'm going to wrap that in parentheses. So that's one Boolean function. Or, and then I'm going to take that same thing and just put in the ship date there as opposed to the order date. And so what this is going to say now, and I want this to be end date. Appreciate all of you who are screaming at your screen for me to catch that. That came through loud and clear. So now what we have here is we're saying we want the order date to be greater than or equal to the start date and less than or equal to the end date or the ship date is greater than or equal to start date and less than or equal to end date so this is going to filter both dates with a pair of parameters as opposed to a filter mm. um, beyond that i think it would be tough to use something like dashboard actions to um to control two different fields at once. Cause I'm trying to think there are set actions, but if we used a set action on order date, it would change a set for just the order dates. If we used parameter actions, it's only going to be single value because parameters can't be multi-select. So we couldn't get multiple dates in a single parameter. I think the best bet for something like that is gonna be either using parameters like this, or maybe if you had like a date dim field. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Yeah, that you could like join out both tables to. Mm -hmm. That might be getting a little too complicated. That's a challenging one for sure, but I think parameters are probably gonna be the best way to go there. Yeah, I would agree. Awesome. We had one more question come in, Jared, that, um, okay, so let's get from Pascal. Like, let's say you have two sheets and a dashboard, a map and a bar chart, as an example. Mm -hmm. The filter actions are happening for both sheets. The, both, the filter actions are enabled. Now, if you click on the map, the bar chart should update accordingly. Yeah. And I can clear the filter by clicking on the map again. However, I want to clear the filter by clicking on the bar chart. Uh, it's not okay. clear the selection. How could we make this happen? It's generally the question. I don't think that's doable. And the reason is the, like in this case, this <laughs> filter action is being driven by this sheet. And so we can kind of see this if we go up to our actions menu and we look at this. The source sheet, maybe we could do this. If we set the source sheet to viz1 or viz2, my hunch is that it's still going to go based off of the selection. So, and this is probably a bad example because we don't have the same fields here. Yeah. Let me try just duplicating this real quick. <laughs> We've had a lot of good tangents here. Yeah. Like yeah. and, and uh... No, these are great questions. And uh, you're the best person for the job, Jared. Trying <laughs> to figure this out. So yeah, I think what's gonna happen is if we if we set the action from either of these sheets, and we should be able to see now that it's like set on viz two or viz one or viz one six. So it's gonna filter this sheet as well. But because we're not selected on sheet viz16, which is this one, clicking on this one is not going to unselect the selection that we have here. So I don't think Tableau is going to support driving a viz action from a selection on one sheet and clearing it from another one. Yeah, we can we can do some digging. Maybe go on a fun one to kind of see if it's possible. We can get back to you. Let's go. It's going to keep me up at night, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, Jared's going to stay up tonight working on that. Um, <laughs> awesome. Guys, we're ready right time. Uh, this has been really good. Really great questions. Thank you um, for all the questions. Thanks for being here. We had 43 participants. It's probably the highest we've had on these calls. So we look forward to yeah. next year.
I can quickly show if people want to hang on. I can quickly show that um, custom background you talked about, Jared. Happy to. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, you got that pulled up. Yeah, we'll have the recording out for this call on uh, our YouTube channel, and it'll be emailed out. So keep in mind, you can you can go to all of the session recordings on our YouTube Zeo Matrix on YouTube. We we track; well, they're all there, and these get sent out. Um, and reach out to us if you have any like questions that are really burning, you need help with. Um, yeah, I'll show I'll show that real quick, and then again, we'll have more information coming out on the sessions next year. It'll likely be. And this on the 17th of January. Uh, so TBD on that session, um, email us if you have ideas for topics that you'd like for us to cover. We're starting to get you know, those topics together. I'll quickly show um, custom background information uh, for, for those interested. So this is our Zeo Matrix. Um, this is our Tableau public page, right? Uh, and the one that Jared was referencing was this KPI scorecard dashboard. Very simple um, type of analysis, just KPIs, right? With with comparisons, um, you know, like looking back a prior year uh, and then some spark lines. But what's unique, uh, I would say, is that I, I built this in PowerPoint. And so I just got these like, and I'm not good at PowerPoint, by the way. They got to get help. <laughs> but I had to, I just built these boxes. And, and he, I will make a caveat that this is tedious to do. It requires more work, but it can it can look great. And I floated these these objects on, and using the layout tab that Jared showed, I was able to get the right sort of fit and the right width and height and an x axis and y axis coordinates. Um, but it's tedious, and you and you if you go this route, whether it's PowerPoint or Figma, is another great option. You you you've got to kind of think through your design ahead of time. And that's the mistake I made. I kept coming back and going, ah, I want to do this now. And I'd have to redo everything. So you really want to kind of prototype it before. Um, what, what's the term in development, Jared, when you, you prototype or you wireframe it, kind of wireframe something, mm -hmm. right? That would be my advice. There's another example we have. Um, this was using Figma. It's the same type of thing, just sort of, you know, uh, almost almost like these boxes that pop out and kind of have a shadow. And then this was floated, floated in. I'm not, I'm not actually sure, Jared, can you, if you bring in a Figma template or, or PowerPoint, can you use containers? I don't think you can. You can float think, containers. You can float containers. <laughs> oh, okay. so you can put them in containers and then float like the That's four across so the true. top and horizontal, the four down the side in a vertical. Yeah. That's yeah. a really good point. Yeah. And then to your point in the demo, I just have some buttons here. I think, um, this one is just show hide. I could have done zone visibility, but it wasn't out yet. It wasn't released. And so that just pops that out. And then we've got filters that drop down and just mm -hmm. different icons. I think I captured all of these from Google, just Google images, save them to my local machine. And then if you want a PDF download, you can you can get that PDF. So hopefully that's some good ideas. It, again, it, it's more tedious to do stuff like this, but it can have a really cool look and feel uh, if you have the time and bandwidth to do it. So. That is all I had. That's on our Zia Matrix webpage. Um, awesome. Okay, guys, that's everything. I've got to jump to a call. We will see you in January. Happy holidays, everyone. Uh, and, and really appreciate you joining these calls. Uh, they've been really fun for us, and we're going to do them next year. Tell your friends, tell your colleagues. We'd love to have more people join. Uh, and let us know if we can help you with anything, okay? Awesome. Jared, thank you as well. That was fantastic, and you've done the last three. So appreciate your time. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'll take a break for the rest of the month. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this, yeah. this is great. And I appreciate all the questions and the interactivity from the community. This has been <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah. Enjoy time with your families over the holidays. We're going to stay safe and we'll see you next year. Okay. Bye, everyone. Yeah. See ya.